good evening to all of you uh, thank you very much for joining for the webinar on asset management and fundamentals on your holiday the poet day today in sri lanka uh, let me welcome our resource person uh, engineer janaka seniratna and all the participants on behalf of women engineers forum of institution of engineers sri lanka without taking much time then i will introduce the resource person engineer seniratna uh was graduated from university of moratua and he worked in central engineering consultancy bureau national building research organization and kalam municipal council in various capacities such as a consulting engineer senior structural engineer geotechnical engineer and area district engineer from 1987 to 1997 then he migrated to australia and pursued his postgraduate studies in engineering management and local government engineering After that he joined the New South Wales state government and served as a senior maintenance and planning engineer for New South Wales state water. He maintained four major dams and in excess of uh, uh, water regulatory structures uh, about 100 water regulatory structures located throughout the central New South Wales. he was a part of implementation group of 3rd year life cycle total asset management plan for new south wales water infrastructure at present engineer senwaratne is working in new south wales local government sector he has been working in the large city council of new south wales that is canterbury bankstown city council for last 20 years and became a specialist in leadership on organizational development asset management project and control management contract management built in compliance management and risk management disciplines he is continuously working on improvement in asset management practices and also he is a public speaker and a freelance writer and in addition to all of that he is a fellow member of the institution of engineers sri lanka and today you will be able to gather good knowledge on this topic and uh, engineer senwaratna over to you thank you very much uh, uh, engineer uh, mrs devika besuria uh, first of all i would like to welcome everyone to this forum uh, i hope that uh, uh, the this presentation will be a productive presentation for you all as as uh, professionals and uh, when i got the uh, request from the uh, women's uh, engineers forum through uh, mrs abesuria and i gave actually three topics so out of these three topics they selected actually uh, asset management as the topic they would like uh, as i expected that's that's happened however i would like to say that uh, asset management uh, discipline is a multidisciplinary and a very wide uh, uh, broad of uh, field it does not belongs to just engineers it uh, belongs to several professionals like engineers and economics and socialists etc so then uh, this presentation will be on fundamentals because i would not be able to complete all this uh, information in this kind of a shorter session and it will be a, like a, uh, a series of lectures in in uh, maybe a year or something but i would like to share my experience and the basic uh, uh, principles in asset management let me uh, share my uh, presentation asset management fundamentals why i put fundamentals as i said asset management is a is a uh, much broader broader uh, discipline and someone if someone wants to be an asset engineer uh, that person must 
first get the knowledge about the asset fundamentals. That's what I'm trying to do today. So just to uh, explain who am I, uh, I am a professional engineer and also uh, my whole career uh, spent on uh, private, uh, uh, the uh, public sector uh, field. So my subject interest is asset management, uh, building compliance regulations and uh, risk management, et cetera. So voluntarily I help a few organizations in Sri Lanka uh, with regard to risk management uh, and performance management areas. So this is my third webinar with IESL. So interestingly, I'm yet to help a, a, a Sri Lankan organization to establish asset management practices. Um, uh, once I tried actually to introduce or uh, initiate the development of a building compliance code for Sri Lanka, it was a failed project because I did a lot in, in my side and but unfortunately it went to the Sri Lankan government uh, cabinet and there's a uh, cabinet approval for developing a building code for Sri Lanka, but after that, it never materialized. So anyway, I learned a lot from that, that uh, project, uh, what the politics and also what kind of uh, uh, the way of handling things uh, even within professional circles. So as uh, Mrs. Abisuri mentioned, I'm a freelance writer. I write a lot about the different things. Then uh, my lifelong journey is actually to become a practitioner of behavioral engineering. You may wonder what this behavioral engineering means. I'll explain a bit. If you see this uh, uh, slide, you can see uh, the behavior is, is, a, is a function of uh, somebody's environment and also person's uh, repertory behavior. So, so what does mean is that if someone is not performing well as a professional, it is not necessarily because of the uh, lack of skills or ability. It is, it is uh, a part of the lack of the absence of or uh, absence of performance support. That means that person's performance will be dependent on the support given through the information, given through the in instrumentations and also motivation. This, this theory was actually introduced by uh, engineer Thomas Gilbert in, in 19, uh, late 90, 90 and late 70s maybe 79, and uh, he became, he is a social, uh, 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 I think psychologist as well. Uh, he got his PhD in that. And then he introduced this theory uh, or the model and it was now in the, in the uh, uh, domain, anyone can study. And then it has been actually improved a lot. So you might have heard uh, behavioral economists uh, who won in 2017, uh, I think Richard Thaler uh, in uh, US, uh, he, he was a, a behavioral economist. Actually, that means psychology, how psychology is applied in different areas. This is how it is applied in the engineering area. So he became the Nobel Prize winner in 2017. Uh, so let me tell you who can be a good asset manager. I know this audience, the reason for attending this, this webinar is to understand to if some interest in asset management. So if you want to be a good asset manager, I would say the first thing is one should practice behavioral engineering. That means you need to know how, how you deal with people, how you deal with uh, technology, how you deal with uh, your motivations, so it's, it's, it's a practicing of behavioral engineering. Then you need to think beyond the asset because 
what asset management means is we think about the value generated from the asset. This is where engineers or professionals struggle to understand the asset management. The next most important one is you have to think about a stakeholders all the time. You can't just go there and do your job and come back and I have done my job in asset management because you have to think your product, how it is embraced by the stakeholders, how the stakeholders are being influenced by your decisions. Who are the stakeholders? Just, just not the customers only. The stakeholders are anyone who has any interest about your business, whether you are in the private sector, whether you are in the public sector, whatever the things you do, if anyone has any interest, maybe a contractor, maybe the government, maybe, maybe uh, uh, just, just the average uh, uh, public, whoever has any interest about your business or your services, they are the people who should look at or uh, make satisfaction. So then also the other thing is one sh should be able to think strategically. What the meaning of the strategic planning? Strategic planning is sometimes is misunderstood as uh, long-term planning. It is, it can be long-term and also it can be short-term. So strategic planning is actually thinking about the whole business. That means your decision must be taken thinking about the whole business, whole organization. That kind of a decisions or planning are, is called strategic planning. So ultimately a good as a manager is one who wants to be a chef, not a cook. What, what I mean by that is this, what a cook do, uh, a cook does is uh, actually take a recipe and prepare a meal. If the cook follows the recipe to the letter and with the ingredient and put the uh, amount specified and then cook the way it has been uh, specified, that cook is not responsible for the output or the quality of the uh, the edibility or uh, any taste of the food he produced because he just acted on a recipe. But chef is different. Chef is, you got on the ingredient. Then that means he or she has to combine these ingredient and take specific amounts and produce, first producer, a recipe and then uh, uh, produce the food, then that person is responsible. That means if the audience or, or the, uh, the uh, uh, is, is not happy with whatever you produce, that means you are responsible for that. So if we want to be a good as a manager, try to be a chef, not a cook. So what assets? There are so many assets we, we can talk about uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, asset management. So assets, people, customers, knowledge, brand, reputation, uh, then uh, uh, physical assets, all these are called assets important for an organization. However, we are today talking about physical assets. So specifically, we are talking physical asset management, but remember asset management is not just physical asset management. It is the management of all the assets within the organization. So, but physical asset is, is a very difficult and engineers uh, deal with these physical assets. And also we have to get all others involved in the asset management because there are a lot of other assets we have to actually manage to make successful in the asset management for an organization. So what are the physical assets? Buildings, road, bridges, major infrastructure, then plant and equipment, you can name a lot. 
Now, if we do not manage assets, what would happen? You will build unplanned assets. Then you will keep unproductive assets. Then you will maintain wrong assets. Then fail to meet stakeholder needs. Because if they are not happy, then what you do is not managing assets. Then fail to meet organizational objectives. Because what we do, uh, do not contribute to the organization objectives. That means you are not achieving anything. Organization as, as an organization fail. So then end up with poor condition assets. Then you will end up with poor capacity assets. That means it is not good enough or uh, big enough or, or a capacity point of view or uh, the features point of view is poor. Then you end up with the technologically obsolete assets. That means you have something is, is uh, old age and then it's not working with the current technological uh, uh, systems and then it, it becomes an obsolete asset. Then end up with a dead assets past economic life. That means you are maintaining something is not productive then end up with assets in the wrong place at the wrong time. That means we are not managing assets. So knowledge, to manage assets, you need to have knowledge. You need to know what you are doing, what you should do. There are guidelines, there are, there are standards. However, it's like swimming. Until you get into the pool and try to swim, whatever things you learn out of outside the pool would not work, would not be enough. That's how this is a knowledge. So when we talk about knowledge, you need to think about what you know and what you don't know, and also be ready to get help from someone and start doing the practically the work and see how the, how the, it responds and then, then learn from that. So last 22 years, I have learned asset management in, in, in Australian environment. Oh, still, I can't say that I know everything because that's, it's like an ocean. So then, uh, but doing things and getting that knowledge cannot be compensated with the, with the uh, paper, paper qualifications or, or uh, guides or anything. So this is what Donald Rumsfeld said. Okay, you know the known knowns, and then you know uh, there are no unknowns. So read this. You can go to web uh, uh, internet and read this. Then you will understand. We don't know everything. Sometimes we don't want to know. Then there are misconceptions about asset management. Not only in 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 in. Uh, uh, the professional fields, uh, professional circles, uh, many areas, even in books sometimes. Uh, so what is, uh, that's why I want to say what is not asset management? It is not maintenance management. Also, it is not facilities management. Then most common misconception is, is collecting asset condition data and Plan for condition improvement is asset management, not just is a very minor thing. Then sometimes you think that, okay, we will, in our organization, we will create an asset management unit, then appoint an asset manager, an asset manager, and then a bunch of staff to compile reports, guidelines, processes, procedures. No, there are more than that. So then, also, it is not about just developing an asset management plan and say that, okay, we comply with asset management standards. The problem there is each asset management plan should suit to the organization rather than just to any standard because every organization work differently, people uh, skills differently. Uh, there are so many differences for uh, each, each organization. So according to 
accordingly our our uh, activities our our procedures processes should be adjusted so then then what it is before we tell that first we have to understand the problem what 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 the solution we are going to find what's the problem here so first thing we need do we know our stakeholder at each level of business that means have you listed they were your stakeholders who are we serving who are they so we you need to know before you find the solution understand the problem do we know them then do we know what they want and what they need remember there are, there's a difference between want and need when a kid cry for a chocolate that's what that kid wants but what the need need is the hunger that means we have to give something to quench that hunger then you uh, when stakeholders ask something from a, a, a service provider organization or any organization they ask what they want but you need to understand what the stakeholder needs then do you know why the stakeholders are unhappy have you ever thought of checking that then are we treating stakeholders equitable manner please note the word equitable i am not saying equal because each stakeholder group or stakeholder holders they require different answer different service different level of service so we have to treat them certain way equitable manner not equal not giving a blanket one one solution to everyone you have to think about that then why do we maintain unproductive asset why it ended up here why we have buildings why we have some roads which are is uh, i mean not serving serving any community or anything why why the road is there why that brick is there and why there's no bridge at the, uh, another place and why don't we have enough funds that means we have we, we poor in planning so that means is our organization structure right do we have right people in right positions to do the job if we don't have skills we don't have right uh, person or people in the organization you can't achieve what you plan for then do our people i mean the employees do they know their roles in terms of asset management so they may be just doing what they have been asked or what they think they are doing then the most important do they have a clear line of sight to the organizational objectives at each hierarchical level if you are working for a unit you need to know what the unit wants from you what the objective of the unit then your department what's the overall objectives of that department then uh, i i meant department is within the organization different departments then when you go to the whole organization what are the what are the objectives everyone should know about what organization wants or what the achieve uh, the objectives of the organization now solving problems is 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 something that uh, everyone will struggle i have given this this is a problem solving approach is a framework uh this is called kenevan so uh, although it's spelled as c y n e f i n uh it's a welsh word and thus is pronounced as a kenevan so it was developed by david snowden in iba he he said that you can categorize this is a framework not a, just a tool okay tool means you can get the solution out of framework is you are working within that framework so you when you have a problem you try to place it in one of the quadrants so if you have a problem you will see that ah this is the cause of this this is the effect it is very very clear i know what to do i know the solution i have to uh, implement this 
It's a simple question. Then you sense it, categorize it, and respond. Then we can write down a best practice for that. That means from that point onward, that uh, problem will not come to you. Then you have a problem, it's a complicated problem. So in that problem, what you do, you have to sense it and then analyze it because you see that uh, some sort of a cause and effect, but only not only one cause, it's a several. So then, then you sense it and analyze and uh, respond. That becomes a good practice. It is not a best practice yet, but it's a complicated because you have guidance, guidelines there. And then, but for the organization uh, uh, point of view, you have to actually give us some sort of a leeway. Okay, later we will adopt this as a best practice, but currently this is good enough. This is a good practice. Then you have complex issues. In that, what you do, you don't know exactly what would happen from one cause to another. Then you have to start getting someone, experts, and ask them, could you please probe this and find out what is happening here? And then they will come up with different options. Then the organization should, okay, this may work or not, because there are differences in opinion as well. Then you will uh, sense it, then respond it. That solution is emergent. That means it's not a permanent solution. That solution will be revised time to time with more information and maybe it become a good practice, later it become a best practice, but it's a long way from that. But think about the other quadrant. It's a chaotic situation. You don't have any idea. Don't, you don't have a clue what is going on in the organization. What do you do? You can't wait because this will collapse the organization. So then what you do, you act first and then sense and then respond. That means this is something now, never happened. And then this solution can be uh, working or not. What's the best example currently for this chaotic problem? It's a COVID-19 situation. No one knew what's what's going on no one knew what happened so then in that case what they did they act on they thought okay uh, we we will we will uh, actually uh, ask them to uh, stay uh, two meter apart and when when you gather okay then uh, later they uh, say uh, no it is transmitting through the through the air so then we had to have masks then we had to have then uh, you had to have uh, vaccine, but we don't. We didn't know uh, which vaccine will work for what. So then they didn't have. They didn't have a time. Normally, it's uh, two to three years time to develop a vaccine, but they had to do it quickly. Then there's an after effect or side effects. So then is a novel idea. So that's that's where it's a classic example of chaotic. But I want to warn one thing: the simple one. When you place a, uh, your problem, asset management or anything into simple category, you must be aware that from simple to chaotic and simple to uh, compli uh, complicated is a, is a uh, precipice, like a, a steep slope. You will fall down to there and become a complicated issue if you put a, a wrong, wrong problem into simple category, and then it become a chaotic or, or complicated. Classic example is, examples are the, the uh, problem solving by politicians. They put it to a simple category, and overnight take decision, overnight uh, uh, issue inside, this is the way we are going to handle, then it become chaotic or calm. So I don't want to give examples, I think you would uh, uh, understand uh, from, from uh, uh, your local experience. So asset management problem is which cotton is a complicated because we got guides and everything, but however, it's complicated because the solution is, is organizational specific. Why we have multiple stakeholders is different to each organization. Then 
you have multiple views, you have varied expectations from everyone, then you have multiple assets, then those assets are sometimes different ages, different condition. So then you, to do everything, you have limited funds. So you have to prioritize it, then limited resources in the sense that uh, maybe uh, human resources, then you have to sense, analyze and respond. So what is an asset? ISO 55000 asset management standard definition is, it is an entity, an item or a thing that has potential or actual value to an organization. This is a very, very broad definition. Look at the words, entity, item, or a thing that has potential or actual value to an organization. You can name anything in, in, uh, in an organization value, people, uh, the reputation, everything. So then that's where uh, most of the professionals fail to understand. Asset management is not uh, just about a physical asset management within an organization. It is the management of all the assets within the organization. They are interrelated, interconnected. If one is not managed properly, you can't get the uh, results out of that. So according to 55,000 people, knowledge, brand, reputation, physical assets, everything could be valuable assets. So we have to manage all, however, as I said, I am only talking about physical assets today. So in, in physical asset management, we only consider assets which would last more than one year. However, there's another qualification that means that should have a significant value as well. If we have a, a puncher, paper puncher, it may last more than one year. So, but it is not a significant value. So it is not considered as a financially differentiable asset. So then asset management uh, definition. I have given here uh, in Australia, asset uh, management council is there. So that's uh, their definition is, uh, I mentioned, they are talking about the life cycle management of physical assets. Then the second one is International Infrastructure Management Manual that was produced by a group of professionals, groups from USA, South Africa, and New Zealand, Australia. It's an international guide. And uh, so it was led by uh, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, this is the uh, definition. It talk about level of service and cost effective manner. That means the level of service we give to the stakeholders, which way the cost effective manner, because you can't do everything because you have limited resources, limited uh, funds. So you have to decide what kind of a level of service we are going to give to the stakeholders. And you have to do demand management and then decide what level they would be uh, happy with and provide resources for that. Then the most important one is the one ISO 55,000. Coordinated activity of an organization to realize value from assets. Coordinated activity, that means you are doing coordinated activity within the organization with all the, all the resources. And realize value from assets. That's the most important one. We are not just talking about asset for sake of maintaining assets. We are talking about the value as extracted from the assets. That is what is asset management. So benefits asset management, as I previously also mentioned, so is, is a better allocation of resources. Then we have to align the asset management activities the organization objectives and stakeholder expectation. Then if we do properly, we can control the need of new assets because new asset means we have to have a capital expenditure and also then maintenance. And uh, the, during life cycle uh, of that asset, you have the liability. So we have to control to the need of new asset 
and getting base out of what we got, then you get the new asset as required basis. Then that means effective use of excess assets. Then uh, you have a meeting legislative compliance needs. Uh, government decide that these things should be done uh, if we are having this kind of asset. So uh, you have to comply with that. Then if you are in the private sector, you need to understand in the developed countries, now all the insurance companies are coming to the private sector organization are forcing them. We need you to do asset management properly. We, will, we are ready to reduce your insurance, insurance uh, premiums. And then you will not have many claims as well. You have to demonstrate the practice uh, uh, better practice management. That means the asset management practices. Because what would happen is if you don't do uh, asset management properly, that means you are contributing to the accident, contributing to the failures when we could, when you could do something. So. When an insurance claim is rejected, if you go to a, a, a legal court, and then at that point, they will argue, these guys could have done something, but they didn't do it. So that's why this happened. So we are not supposed to give, uh, 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 honor this claim. That's what is happening. So this will come to countries like Sri Lanka also later. Uh, so you must be prepared for that. Then the other thing is, in Australia, even the uh, state government actually influenced the local government in 2007 and introduced a, a new reporting system in New South Wales uh, uh, city councils, them to uh, practice asset management. They forced us to do that. Then after that, in around 2013-14, they actually assess all the councils, whether they are fit for the uh, future. When they found some councils not fit for the future, they asked them to merge with other councils and make a fit council for the future. So it happened, it lost a lot, a lot of jobs uh, of people and also politicians. And that's how the government introduce asset management principles or other the, the directives to uh, government organizations. So I know in Sri Lanka, this is not an area uh, 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 at the moment uh, any, any attention, but they should be because most of the current situation in the country as well is, is, is because of the uh, uh, failure of asset management across the whole whole country. Then we need a budget to implement asset management function. So how, if you look at this, this uh, uh, diagram, you can see initially you spend money for capital investment. Then you maintain, you, you, have, you need money for that. Then you do a capital renewal. That means you replace row for if a building, if, if if a rod, you uh, relay the uh, top uh, uh, bituminous layer, and then uh, sometimes you re reconstruct uh, the, some of the, uh, the rods and bridges. You may have to improve the, the loading capacities, and maybe we have to widen this. So then at the end, you have to dispose right time. This is less than the design time sometimes, because this life, is an economic life we are talking about. So this is, that means a productive life because you can have a building without giving any productive uh, output and there. So we have to get rid of that building. Otherwise you are maintaining the wrong asset. So that means the disposal also will cost. So that means for this life cycle costing, you need funds. You have to plan for that. Then when you look at the asset management, you have two different way of doing it. One is asset centric, other one is service centric. Asset centric is actually you are maintaining or management of the assets 
just to comply with technical and compliance requirements. That means you know what to do with some of that. So, so you have a vehicle fleet, you every six months you send it for uh, replacing uh, oil, replacing uh, the uh, filters. And so that's this just maintaining the asset centric. And the, in the service centric is okay, this vehicle is used for the, uh, this kind of a purpose. For they require this kind of facilities. They need uh, air conditioning inside. They, they need uh, they need uh, uh, they, this vehicle is driven for so many uh, kilometers uh, 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 during this period. That means this has to be serviced more often than than that. And then we have to uh, have these these uh, features for this asset. And this is service centric. That means you look at the service it's given by that asset and maintain or manage that as that way. That's called a delivering a service. Then you think about the asset management culture within the organization. So it is, it is when you say asset management processors, they are handled by humans using machines, tools, software. You have asset management software. You develop all the plans and then implement however is done by humans so that's a misconception okay we can replace all humans with machines no it is not going to happen what would happen is the routing actions routing things will be replaced by machines however it machine cannot replace the emotional understanding of the, how the things are done and then how the humans behave, how the humans react to certain things, how the information is used to make decisions. These things we need human. So that means their role will be different when we have more machines, more tools and more software. However, they should be there. So that means their role will be different. So in an organization, asset management is viewed as and organization culture as well. So if this culture is not there, the leadership will fail to reap benefits. If you think about the asset management organization, there are four types of organizations. One, the first one is the very, very raw organization is management by instinct. Second one is the management this is a dependent organization. Third one is independent. Fourth one is interdependent. I have followed a training program delivered by J.R. Lafreya and uh, J. Hardwick. Uh, so this is uh, one of the books they produce. It's uh, one of the classic books in asset management. And it is, it is completely different to uh, other, other theoretical books. So. It is, it is uh, towards operational excellence. So this is how the organizations are developed. So I'll just briefly give you what are the characteristics of this type of uh, organization. In the management by instinct organization, there are no rules or laws. There's no control at all. They have money just to meet, uh, the, uh, meet the budget. So that what they are trying to do is, do whatever you can within the budget. If, if, if it fails, don't fix it. Just throw it out, use the existing ones, and then uh, try to uh, save. Then short-term savings. Always think short-term. Then the next one is dependent organization. Dependent organization, typical like government organizations, driven by external laws. You have been asked to do this. You just control the key activities. If there's uh, any breakdown or anything, you have enough, enough money, adequate budget to uh, repair it or, or whatever, is all reactive. In this organization, a lot of heroes, is, they are called breakdown heroes. That means you are a uh, top manager or the director, is kind of, ah, this guy is a very uh, well, proactive guy. This guy, this broken down and he, he quickly uh, uh, fixed it. So it's a breakdown heroes. But there may be a person who try to think, how can I avoid this breakdown? Those people will not be uh, appreciated by the management. 
in this organization. It's a dependent organization. So then the third one is, is a fairly good organization. It's an independent organization. These laws are internalized. That means the management prepare all the rules and regulations what to do. And all, all the activities are in control. We have a standard practice. We try to avoid failures. That's good. Then we have proactive and preventative maintenance of assets. And we can say oh, we are in a world class and we are competitive edge. Okay, among the peers, we are doing good. However, our aim is not that. Our aim is to become an interdependent organization. That means the laws are assumed by conviction. That means it's autonomous. No one is asking you to do this because you, you know that you have to do this and no one prompts you to do it. You do it. That's laws are assumed by the conviction. That means I know in my heart I have to do this this way. Then always try to control this proactive whatever we are doing. Then we have a team dynamics and is animate innovative actions. That means when, whenever we do something, we, we help each other and come up with something innovative and make it good or, or, or uh, sustainable. Then you have an improvement culture. That means not just fixing or preventing or prevention of failure. We are improving the system, improving culture, continuous improvement. They are the best in the business in, uh, and operational excellence. Not many organizations. So, but that's the aim should be. So, when you think about the stages of asset management maturity, then uh, you know, uh, first one is uh, the, the, uh, the asset management fundamentals are, are implemented. So those, 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 those are uh, ad hoc. So that means we, we don't do it uh, the consist uh, consistency basis. The next one is aware. That means you know the asset management fund fundamentals as an organization, but you implement it sporadically. So then there's no consistency across the organization. The achieving one is good because the fundamentals are demonstrated and implemented and also processes are there, but there's one missing link. That means whatever you do is not aligned with the business objectives or business needs. When it comes to operational excellence, then that's the perfect match. That means you are doing your asset fundamentals, uh, all implemented uh, uh, and we can see the evidences and also all the processes and procedures are documented. And also we have a monitoring system and also whatever we do is aligned with business needs. Always the improvement is, is in, in, on the card. So this is what we aim normally. So I would like you all to do a self-assessment of your own organization. In this tiered structure where your organization is, that means depending on where your organization is, you have to do a lot or less. So your long-term aim is operational excellence in asset management. So when you implement asset management uh, in the organization, you have these fundamental, you have to have these fundamental beliefs. That means value proposition. That means you just not think about the asset. You are think about what value it can provide to the organization. Next one is the second belief is the alignment. Your stakeholder needs and asset management system requirement both should be aligned. Otherwise, stakeholders will not be happy. Third one is the assurance. Your stakeholders need assurance from your organization that you have systems, you have processes, you have procedures which enable the delivery of their needs. They will question you, what are you doing? Why you are not providing this service to this level? 
why don't you have computer system to do, do uh, 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 produce these reports uh, or, or uh, our, our, our uh, certificates or whatever they're asking. So that means the service you are providing should be assured but to the systems and the stakeholders will be happy to see that. Then the leadership, nothing will work until the leaders within the organization believe in asset management. They have to support, they have to implement systems, they have to provide money for software systems and uh, uh, getting the skilled people. That means if leaders are not believing in asset management, whatever the rest of the staff do will not work. So that, leader, that uh, leadership should come from the top down. Then when you want to do asset management in your organization, you have to produce certain, certain documentation, certain things. What, this is in, in line with uh, uh, whatever the guidelines. So you need to develop asset management policy for your organization. That's a guiding principle. That means what we should achieve in the long run, as the, that's our policy. So then the strategy comes, then the strategic asset management plans. These are documents with all the details about your assets and as, assets as a whole. That means all the assets together, how you going to manage. Then the asset class. So we may have roads, we may have buildings, we may have plant and equipment, we may have trees, we may have uh, so many uh, the different type of uh, uh, the bridges. So it's an asset class is the bridges, the roads, buildings. So you have to have individual plans for each class. Then within the class, you have an asset group. Think about buildings. You may have community buildings. You may have child care centers. As then you may have health related buildings. These are the, the building code or uh, I mean, in Sri Lanka, we don't have a currently one, but it is a usage requirement. All the regulations for the building uh, comes, maybe a UDA regulation, this comes depending on the usage. So that means that for different usage, different asset groups group have a different requirement. So your asset management plans must deliver that. Then the facilities asset management plans. That means how do you maintain it? How do you actually operate it? Uh, how the cleaning is done, how, how the sustainability measures are taken. Those things are in the facilities as well management plans. Then you have operational and utilization plan. That means you give the asset to another group to use and get the value out of that. How do you operate it? Okay, how, how, how we, we uh, actually have the uh, utilities uh, like uh, water, power and uh, telecommunication, these things. So then how, how do you utilize it? Okay, uh, is it under lease agreement we use or whether we just allow anyone to come to the building and then uh, use it and then charge amount? There are hotels, there are so many type of buildings. Then, then So if we think about the asset groups, then uh, the, uh, how, the, how we operate these assets, how, how we use it. Then we have program management system plan. That means we run programs. Okay. These programs, how you, how you plan it. Then project management system plan. That means sometimes you upgrade assets, replace assets. So how is the project management system is working? Then a risk management system plan. Previously, I have done a, a one webinar to ISL forum on risk management. So uh, I'm just uh, touching that, that subject here. You can get the, those recordings and uh, uh, listen to that. And uh, if you want to get a uh, full understanding about risk management systems and then the safety management systems, that's the, the workers or the employees, how the safety, if anyone visiting the, the facility or the, uh, the, any, anyone using a road, anyone using a bridge, how you manage their safety. So safety management systems cover all, all, all stakeholders 
uh, who are associated with the, with, the, with the asset. So then before you start this journey, you have to have a certain preparatory words. First thing you do is customer and stakeholder profiling. That means you have to understand your customer, you have to understand your stakeholder. Start collecting information, what they, what, who they are, what kind of uh, the uh, entities. So start collecting information. That's called customer stakeholder profiling. Because if a customer comes to your organization, from the point he enters to the building and leave in the building, you have to think about the customer experience. That person, what kind of experience that person will undergo during the time staying within that, that uh, business. So you have to think about what kind of a customer it is. So what they expect. So then you then, when they, you understand what the customers or stakeholders need, then what you do, you develop a range of services and how you are going to give that uh, service. Maybe you yourself deliver that service. Maybe you subcontract it to another organization could it be deliver uh, for us. But you have to set service levels, whether you deliver it or someone else deliver, because you are responsible for making the stakeholders satisfied. So you set service level. You have to write down this thing. You have to collect information and quantify it. What is the service level we are going to provide? Those service level could be affordable and also could be good enough for the stakeholder. That's the balance you have to this. Then you need to know what assets you got because you have asset solutions. When you deliver a service, you can have assets and also sometimes non-asset uh, solutions. But if you have asset solution, then you need to have asset database. And where are it? Is? Where are these assets? and then think about, then do assessment. How many there? What's the capacity? What's the capability? What is the condition? What is the remaining life? What is the value of this? You need to know what you got. Do, to do asset management, you need to know what you have and what condition, what quantity, the, all the information you need to know. Then it is a balancing act. What? According to asset management, uh, ISO 55,000, it is a balancing act of performance, cost, and risk. So asset management is always a balancing act. When you want uh, the asset performance, it will cost certain amount and also it has certain risk. So when you try to eliminate all the risk, cost will go up. Then you can give a good performance, but you can't afford it. So it is a balancing act. So then the focus elements is, you have to have committed leadership, financial sustainability. These are the focus elements in the interdependent, that means the highest level organization. That's where you are aiming at. So asset management system processes and procedures. Then you have to have reliable data. That means you have to collect data but make sure you only collect relevant data because data collection is always expensive exercise. If you collect wrong data, you, you are wasting your resources. And also remember, when you start collecting data, you have to update data periodically because when, when you finish collecting data and derive information, that is snapshot at that time. After one year or six months, your data is different. You are making decisions based on uh, old data. Then you have to update that. That costs money. So it is a, it is a iterative process, and you need to make sure you are only collecting relevant data and uh, derive information. Then you need a good bunch of people in the organization. They should be capable, practically. And qualification-wise, practically, just qualification won't help. You need people who can practically do the job. Paper qualification means nothing if you can't do the job. Then you have to have attitudes, correct attitude. That means a committed people. And then always we deal with risk. Anything we do comes with risk. 
then you should have a proper risk management from procedure and processes. Then you have to have continuous improvement mindset. Then just organization culture. What I mean by that is the leadership and the organization should treat staff very just manner. If, if you are treating them bad, they will not deliver the re, uh, required service. So that means whatever processes, whatever systems in place would not uh, get anything uh, because you are not actually providing the, 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 the just uh, culture within the organization. Then you have to have high standards. You can't put a low standard and be happy. Ah, we have achieved it. That's where the problem is. Sometimes you put standards very low and then be happy, but stakeholders are unhappy because the quality is very low level. So you have to set high standards within the organization and work for that. Then assurance and governance, I mentioned uh, previously as well, you have to give assurance to stakeholders. Then all the decision making should be by all, not just the management make visions and ask people to do the job. Everyone should be participated in different levels and contribute to the final. That's where the ownership comes of the decisions. Otherwise, asset management will not work within the organization if they don't own the action. Then we have to maintain the consistency. You can't run something this year and next year drop it. You have to think about, okay, we have to maintain this consistency of what we are doing is continually we are doing. Then we have to monitor is an improvement commitment. That means we have to monitor where is it working what we said. We have to change it. We have to improve it. That commitment should be there. I'm talking about very high level organization. So I mentioned uh, the initial steps. So these ones, we, we identify the customer, develop profiles, wants and needs, and their needs. Then we have to convert needs to services. Then we come up with solutions to deliver these services, be need assets or non-assets. Then we have to have a service profiles for each asset class. That means we have a, uh, buildings as a class, then we have service profiles. That means we know what are the services delivered by these buildings, these, these assets. So for roads, what kind of services we, we provide. Then, then we need to develop what the stakeholder want at the service level. Then we know what the technical service level to maintain it and what we can afford. Then we have to actually these are the, the, the drivers for the service uh, service level. So we check the legislative requirement, organization uh, requirement, a strategic requirement, then the resources availability. So these are the drivers. Customers look at this as quality. We need quality. We need this work, the function. Then they will talk about the capacity and utilization or utilization. That means this should be I mean, uh, workable enough for us. That's where the customer and stakeholder expect from the organization. So then technical service level, as an organization, we have a limited budget. We have operational setup. Then we have a maintenance setup. Then we have a certain amount of money to replace certain things and renew something. So upgrading plan. These are the, the, the areas we, as an organization look at us setting the technical service level. So making the customer stakeholder happy, what you do, these two service level must be comparable or, or maybe a one level. Sometimes it's not the same level, but we try to come with the compromise level to make both happy. Then capacity assessments, uh, we have to do asset capacity and what are the gaps? We got asset, we don't have enough capacity to deliver the service. Then we identify the capacity gap. 
and we have to do something about this is where what we do when you want to implement asset management in your organization first thing you have to do is you have to do a certain self assessment this is called asset management maturity diagnostic analysis that means in the future you want to be an interdependent organization currently are we instinctive or dependent or independent where we are so depending on that we can actually do certain things to reach to interdependent level so you need to actually do a certain assessment this is done by a specialist uh, asset management uh, uh, experts and i will give you a bit of information about some of the charts they they provide with the report if you look at this this is if you see a red red color is the gap this gap you must reach that means from the information they collected from the organization your strategic planning is at 2.5 level we need 3 that means there's a gap here or uh, uh, the sorry each one is maybe 2.5 uh uh 2.25 at that level and then there's a gap here then annual budgeting how you are doing uh, the uh, budget preparation and this there's a gap here the, to the best practice then annual reporting how you do the reporting then what do we have a policy and it's it's a good policy there's a gap here do you have the strategy no strategy at all for this organization then you look at these these ones and come up with the improvement plan that's the first thing you have to do that improvement plan should be in accordance with asset management principles there's another way of providing this sometimes they give you spider chart and then they, their items is is a similar areas but sometimes more detail how the structure how the responsibility is within the organization this is the type of thing you need to do your own organization each one should have this kind of one where we are now where we want to be or what are the gaps then you come up with the improvement plan as i said you need to have a policy these are guiding principles and in that what the objectives and then the attention stream of the policy then what do we want or why do we want a policy look at the last one optimum use of assets so the the in that policy you are answering to this question are we getting the value out of assets if we know the answer is no then you say something this is the way we are going to get the value out of assets so are we inform are we informing stakeholder what is really going on is there any good reporting system good clear clear communication plan no then the policy should specify something then the performance are we fulfilling stakeholder objectives if you are not doing it how we are going to do it this is the policy this is what we are going to do i mean as a policy wise so these are the questions you need to answer in 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 in, in uh, when we develop a policy then asset management pitch uh, strategy this is the big picture what is our current situation what do we want to be in the long run how will we get there and what are the key objectives and milestone then in the strategic asset management plan these are the items normally typically you could cover actually this is maybe a too much theoretical is a boring maybe uh, to the audience but when when you later read this recording uh uh listen to this recording you can see these these items and then these are the things you need to do okay when you develop a strategic asset management plan that's why i said asset management is a vast field i'm just chatting uh, uh touching the the surface of of this this uh, subject so uh so i can't do justice uh to the uh, subject by doing this kind of a presentation but i am trying to give you a clue 
what is this, how enormous this, this, this field is, and also how you start from scratch and first start walking, then uh, running. So then the asset management plan, this is for each asset class, like roads, buildings, bridges, uh, you name it. Uh, so then these are the, the items that would come in that kind of asset management plan. These are first documents, but this will be now converting into geographic uh, or, or visual, audio visual, uh, I mean, not audio, but visual, visual plans. That means in software, you can go to uh, a location and click the uh, point and then you will get the, all the information, particularly for that kind of asset. What, what are the, uh, the uh, features there? What is going on there? What kind of capital works are being done those places? So these, uh, these documents are getting digitized now. In, in, in developed countries. Then the asset group level asset uh, uh, plans, what are the things? Then the, uh, the last one is facilities asset management plans for individual assets. So if, if, if you look at this, this you uh, look at the, in, if you have a big uh, structure like a major, maybe Sydney Harbour Bridge or, or a, or a, or, a, or a major uh, tower, tower building, or a town hall building, or anything. So then you need to have a one asset management plan for that particular asset because it is. If you have ten of those buildings, you can have you can't have a one asset management plan for it because asset itself is a significantly big. So if you, if you think about uh, the uh, the Lotus Tower or or or. or uh, Nelum Pocono, that kind of uh, major structures, you need to have asset management plan for those uh, assets separate. So then think about the, uh, uh, then the asset operation and uh, utilization plan. That means assets are being used to provide the service to stakeholders. The, there are user groups. Maybe uh, you should have a facility management strategy and plans. So that means how do how do you use this building? Uh, is under lease agreement, or or we just allow people to come and hire the building, or uh, that kind of one? So are we, what kind of services we are going to provide from this? How this building is used to provide? Is maybe a passport office or uh, a different uh, 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 organization? Then you know if it's a oil refinery, then then how how you how you uh, uh, operate that? So they, you need to have certain plans. So how do you save energy? Uh, so how how the how the stakeholders are benefited? Then you need to something called stakeholder benefit realization plans. So so those should be developed. That means you develop something to make sure that you are doing the right thing. Program management. I think most of you know about when you run a program. Then you have to identify what kind of program, how 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 you are going to actually formulate it, what, how do you deliver it, then how do you appraise, uh, then how do you stop that program? Because some programs you uh, do for just for short term, maybe a six month, maybe a year. Then on the pro when the program finish, you have to make sure that is the dissolution strategy also there. So. Then when you think about the project management, I know a lot of people talk about project management. However, what I see in many countries is that this is the area they are not doing right because they do project management in the, in the sense the managing the project, but not project management system. So this is where the problem comes. When we want to do a major project or acquire an asset, new asset, first thing is to actually assess and then decide whether we should go or no go. That's sometimes called feasibility studies and justifications. A lot of studies should be done with the stakeholders, what the stakeholders need, 
whether this will deliver, whether we have money to maintain it, whether we have enough to use this. And that's where the go, no go decision is made. Suppose we made that decision and passed that gate, then the, we have a strategic option. So what kind of asset we are going to build? What kind of a building? What kind of a bridge? How, how long, how, uh, how wide, how many lanes there? So you decide it. That there are options. Then you decide and then go to a business case. That means this is where we are now ready to go ahead, okay? This is a business case to get approval. Remember, until gate three, you can drop the project. After that, then we decide, okay, we are going ahead, then go to gate four. Then we readiness for the market. That means we prepare all the contract document, tender document, agreements, everything, because we have to think about the, our customer, we have to think about the, our stakeholder, we are going to give that benefit to them, okay? That means we have to actually prepare those agreements, everything to make sure that if it is a wider community, okay, then we have to think of whether the community get the best out of this. Then you test the market. Then you follow tendering process, very, very transparent tendering process, and then get the best service provider to deliver this project. Then after that, you get the project and then you are ready to for the service. That means the your uh, stakeholders will get the benefit. So this is the implementation of the project uh, uh, gateway system. Uh, uh, first, you have to develop it and then implement it and then monitor it. So this is the one currently system used by state government in New South Wales state government, all the uh, agencies, organizations, and also our, our council where I work, they are using this. This is this was implemented only two, two years ago in our council. So then uh, this is something, I mean, as, as a trend in, in, in Australia. So this is a very good way of uh, uh, actually uh, get, get the, the approval uh, process through this gate system. So even, even some politicians are in trouble as well. Sometimes uh, if we influence anyone to uh, go to a business case, then uh, go or no go uh, is not being recommended by your evaluation panel, you will be in trouble. So that's why these, these systems are in place. So now risk management system plans. Uh, I, as I said in my previous uh, webinar also, I mentioned uh, the specifically on risk management. So we have to have risk management uh, uh, principles listed and then we have a policy. Then we should have a strategy objectives listed, compliance, quantity and quality, and then these are the focus areas you need to have uh, when you develop uh, uh, risk management plans. Then you have to develop an enterprise risk management framework for your organization. Then comes with the risk management plan and also business continuity management plan. Because if you are not managing risk, you will be, uh, you won't be able to actually deliver your services. Then you need to have a contingency plan or something called business continuity management plan. This is the area I am currently helping one of the Sri Lankan government organization to implement risk management systems and uh, procedures. So I am very closely working with that organization. Hopefully that organization will be uh, reaping benefits uh, when uh, that is uh, implemented. So they are at the moment, uh, contemplating whether to go ahead with the ISO 9000 uh, accreditation as well or not, but it's a hard way to, hard the path to go there because you have to maintain it a certain level and for the accreditation. Um, accreditation. But uh, for risk management, there's no such uh, accreditation, but uh, uh, it is a compliance requirement. So in that uh, we can actually implement best practice. So I think all the organization 
the, whether it's a government, whether it's a private or corporate sector, you need to have risk management systems plans in place, no matter what. Then safety management plans. These are all the operational level plans. That means how you maintain uh, the chemicals, how you, uh, meant, uh, how you manage uh, uh, workers within confined spaces, how do the corrective actions taken, and a lot of these things are operational system plans. And uh, in, in the council I'm working, these, all these are in place. So then I don't see why uh, in uh, Sri Lankan local government, at least municipal councils across the uh, country and also government organizations, why not have these kind of uh, plans? It is not that difficult. What we need is attitude and, and uh, seeking help. Then it continues all, all this because we are protecting our people or employees who are working within the organization in the private sector as well, definitely these should be. And then the, that's, uh, if you do these things, you can avoid fatal accidents within the, and also people are aware safety is first in an organization. So in a summary, the, uh, the, uh, this roadmap is a continuation of this uh, developing the policy, then the strategy. I, I uh, put certain uh, actions that should be done to, uh, if we are going this path. You can see it is an enormous amount of work. It's not an easy thing, but you have to start from somewhere. Then you have to continue with this, this journey and then, then develop these all these service levels and uh, maintenance levels, and then the resources plan, how the people, funds, and assets are uh, managed during uh, the life cycle of the uh, management of the assets. We have to balance the cost risk and performance. This is a complete the summary of what I have uh, discussed already. And these are the things you need to do if we genuinely want to introduce asset management in your organization. So thank you very much. I hope that uh, it, it's a long, long uh, uh, session, but I hope that uh, you got something out of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, from the audience, if you have any questions, you can raise your questions to the speaker or you can uh, type it in the chat, then we will forward it to the speaker. Your questions or comments are welcome. Uh, yeah, can I speak? Uh, I'm Asoka Pereira uh, from University of Moratua. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, first, I would like to thank Mr. Senivaratna, you know, coming in a very comprehensive asset management, uh, 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 this knowledge area. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Senivaratna, as you said, uh, it's a journey and it's a quite a difficult journey. Probably Sri Lanka, we are now discussing and some organizations are attempting. Uh, I would like to ask a question like, uh, and I was involved with two organizations, uh, even right now I'm in, involved with one organization trying to initiate uh, put asset management system uh, uh, into place of an investment of 65 million US dollars. Uh, uh, Knowing Sri Lankan setup and other things, uh, one of our challenges is first to recognize our position and as well as get the top management agreed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can you tell how it happened in Australia? Like, you know, uh, like how, uh, you know, proactive work uh, people did or engineers did and how it, you know, came to 
uh, this level and particularly New Zealand and Australia are leading in asset management applications and uh, concepts uh, compared to many other countries. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, how, how can we learn from that exercise? Yeah, actually, the, it is the first thing is the understanding it is a common sense approach. So then what what happened is in, in, in Australia, because I am uh, I am working in the local government sector. In the local government sector, the the directive actually came in in the year 2007 from the Department of Local Government to all the councils. However, before that, they realize they are they are getting complaints from the people or the stakeholders. You are not doing your job. So then the other thing is they are borrowing, they start borrowing money from the, uh, the state government or the federal government to run their services, to uh, improve their uh, assets. That means they themselves realize it is not working. So then uh, what they uh, try to understand is, as I said, first, when I, when I went to uh, the council where I work, they didn't have an asset list originally. That means they didn't know what they own. So that means they had multiple lists and different names for the assets. So then actually I helped them to actually prepare the original asset list as well. So then uh, they actually start from the scratch because they realize people are complaining and they are not doing their uh, job and also financially not sustainable as well. So then they started uh, well before the, uh, the uh, Department of Local Government uh, uh, forced them to do uh, asset management system. What they do is they have to have a four year plan, the uh, delivery plan and also annual delivery plan. Annual delivery plan comes with all the capital works or whatever they require. Then four year plan also, that means they plan their projects or capital improvements major renovations, everything four year in advance. Then you can uh, also, they have to do a, prepare uh, something called community, community plan. That means they have to talk to all the stakeholders and prepare a community plan. And that community plan identified which areas the organization should uh, put their, their emphasis or, or the priorities. And then they, are, they have to actually uh, display it publicly. And then they, in, the, in the public, they actually uh, give their comments. So then, then after that, they uh, finalize a, a social uh, uh, community plan. After community plan, that's a 10 year. It's valid for 10 year, but every year they, they review it. And also four year plan, delivery plan, they uh, uh, review it every year. However, it is in line with come up with a new set of politicians. They will look at the uh, four, uh, next four year delivery plan and make their priorities. And at that point, what they do is they, they can't just drop one, uh, one project or, or reject one project. It must have a justification why we are doing it. That means that is done scientifically. And the, but at that time, the whole organization will have a new organization structure. That means the general manager should take the uh, organization structure to the uh, council and get the approval. At that point, some people may lose jobs. Some, uh, some, uh, some uh, units may be restructured. That's why. In, in countries like uh, New Zealand or Australia, and the job security is not like in other countries. It's not that there because they have to do the job. All the organization, uh, the, they have to do the job. Sometimes it's not their fault also losing the job. So that, that's how they are always improving. That means you have to start from the scratch. That means start identifying who are the customers, stakeholders, what they want, 
and to deliver their uh, needs, what kind of assets you need? Maybe non-assets. Sometimes we don't need assets to deliver certain services, but th there, there's a, a, a process there. And also there are the guidelines, guidelines that we have uh, something called international uh, uh, double M, uh, international infrastructure management manual, double I double M. So then we uh, follow the uh, ISO 55,000 guidelines. And then all these guidelines are there. However, they are just documents. You have to actually look at the organization, the, the culture, the way organization deliver things. While, uh, depending on the organization, your asset management approach is different. So it is an ongoing process. So one of the most important one, as I mentioned, doing the diagnostic analysis. That means somebody should look at all areas, how the systems there, what are the systems there, what kind of data you are currently collecting, what is the confidence levels of those data? Is it reliable? Is it just data? Nobody knows whether it's correct or not. These are the things. So you have to start from the scratch. But as always, then since, as, as Professor Pereira says, uh, then uh, you are now working in a university now, there should be some kind of, uh, I mean, information or training given or a knowledge given at the graduate level as well, appreciating asset management. So otherwise, when they go to the field, if they don't think like an asset manager or uh, uh, do not know any, anything about asset management, they would not deliver the, the service we require as an engineer. So that's why I mentioned behavioral engineering and concept is thinking about people doing the job and thinking the psychological side as well. I, I don't know whether I gave yeah, you Thank enough. you very much. I think, yeah, yeah, that, that helped uh, uh, give a certain comfort and as well as, yeah. Uh, so I, I think uh, Sri Lanka too is, you know, at the very, starting point uh, uh, compared to australia or something uh, uh, but but this is a this is a path that we have to take otherwise you know yeah. uh, you find that assets are failing you, you know my thing is i i know uh, uh, whenever i see some problems like you know for example a canal with dirty water uh, sometimes i know what is this the reason and i know the sewer pumps are not working yeah, uh, yeah. so it's not the people who are putting things it's a sewer pump that is not working and polluting the uh, canal uh, to a very great extent. Uh, so, you know, th those are the problems. Uh, sometimes the roads people see when there are faults, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, critical assets like when a sewer pump is not working, nobody cares. It just goes to somewhere and then uh, it's like that. But then, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, I think still the problem is the people should demand the service levels, I think. Yeah. That, that is still lacking uh, uh, in our country. Uh, Actually, one, one thing I, I want to tell you is uh, I, I heard a very nice uh, speech from one of the former generals in, 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 in Australia, uh, in army. He, he mentioned a very good statement. He said, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. That means when you go out from your home, and go to a road, and then if you see the road is this bad condition, if we walk, just, just accepting it, that's where the problem is, because that's the standard you accept. Otherwise, you have to do something. At least call the local council and say, this is, this is, this is the condition of this. So if collectively, if everyone is doing their job and uh, uh, the, give attention, uh, not accepting the quality you see, then that's 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 where the beginning should be. Because in an organization, sometimes if you walk, uh, if the boss is walk into the organization and see two people are chatting, and the customer is waiting in the in the counter, and if that boss is just walking into his office and do their his job, that's something wrong there, because that boss allowed that to happen. So that means. 
indirectly he accepted it. The situation is okay. So that, that's, that's where the attitude should come within the organizations and or as collectively, because in our organization also, what they say is now there's a, something called a new, new thing coming in Australia, it's called strategic placemaking. That means you walk into a town center or something and, and then look at everything together, where the pathways and the benches are clean, whether, whether the bus stop is, is clean enough and then a uh, road is uh, no potholes and look, look at the whole thing is a one view, the customer point of view. If the garbage has been collected, everything together. This came from United Nations, uh, few, uh, I think 10 years ago or something, they were talking about strategic placemaking in for cities. So now it is being actually implemented in council settings. Now in di uh, different councils, now they have a separate unit called strategic placemaking. That means you look at the whole picture together and do something. That person will then call each division this is there's a problem here. There's a problem here. Could you please do that? Because what otherwise what would happen individually, the road guy will go do and do the road uh, repair and walk away. He can he could see something wrong with the with the water line. That person didn't care because it's not my job. Thank you, sir. Uh, if you get clarified anything, you can forward it now or your comments can be forwarded to the key resource person today. Yeah, actually, if anyone wants uh, further details about access management or any, any, any comments or anything, uh, my uh, email address uh, is, uh, was given uh, in the, in the uh, so I will, I will put uh, to everyone my email address. And if anyone uh, uh, wants to uh, get any clarifications, uh, you can send me an email. Thank you, sir. So uh, let's move to the... Uh, uh, excuse me, then, uh, can I make a comment then? Thank yes. you very much, Engineer Sevini Ratna, for the excellent presentation. And also, I think of Sashu Kapera highlighted what we are doing in Sri Lanka. It's good to hear that now at least some organizations have started the asset management processes. I know that he's involved. And uh, the other thing, actually, all the organizations should do this, but it's high time to start in Sri Lanka because I know. Uh, with my experience, the allocation of resources is done without doing any studies and uh, actually the needs are controlled these days to have the new assets, but it's the, uh, it's done ad hoc because no, no, nobody has studied, but nobody assess what we have, but uh, all of a sudden they say that uh, to control the need of new assets but no need to buy new assets, so like that. Then I think it's high time to start the asset management process in all the organizations in Sri Lanka. And thank you, uh, it's only a comment, then thank you, uh, Prof. Sasha Kapir and uh, Engineer Janusen Ratna for the conversation, because we have gathered a lot from these uh, conversation also, other than the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for, because uh, sometimes uh, this, uh, Presentations are a bit boring <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, a lot of lot of uh, I mean uh, we talk about a lot of plans and then then uh, uh, but uh, ultimately we have to whether you are working in a private sector or, or, or the corporate sector or public sector all have relevancy in asset management you have to do asset management uh, otherwise you will you will end up in in uh, losing money unnecessarily and for uh, capital works. And also uh, the one thing that Sri Lanka is currently actually facing is also, we are very good at building things, but we don't have, we, we do not plan before, before building. And then also we don't have uh, any uh, processes and procedures to maintain it and uh, uh, keep up with the asset uh, productivity. 
that means uh, ultimately we have wasted a lot of money. Uh, so that means we have to uh, live within our means uh, because uh, otherwise, otherwise uh, what would happen is uh, this will be a burden for the future generations as well. Thank you, thank you all uh, for listening to my long, long uh, uh, webinar. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the audience? Any more questions? I think it seems there are no more questions. And if, if you have questions, you can forward it to Engineer Janaka Senuidatna via email, as we mentioned his email address in the chat box also. Next, I'll move to the next event of the agenda. Let me share my screen. As an appreciation of hope, hope it is visible. As an appreciation of engineer Janaka Senaviratne. And Nadika, Nadika, we can't see the screen. Ah, okay, now it's okay. Okay. As an appreciation of engineer Janaka Senaviratne for the time and valuable input he has shared with us today, I would like to offer this virtual moment as an effort of appreciation on behalf of Women Engineers Forum of IESA. Thank you very much. Presented to engineer Janaka Senaviratne by the Women Engineers Forum of the Institute of Sri Lanka, Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka, as an expression of appreciation for tremendous contribution as the resource person for the webinar on asset management fundamentals on 18th of December 2021. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the forum uh, for giving me uh, this opportunity and also uh, 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 presenting this. Thank you. Uh, next item in the agenda is proposing the board of thanks. And Nabika Surya, executive committee member of Women Engineers Forum of Institute of Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. A very good evening to all the professionals gathered here today. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver a word of thanks on this great occasion. On behalf of Women Engineers Forum and the participant, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our resource person today, Engineer Janaka Senamiratne, for sharing views and your experience with us on this very important topic. Today's lecture was full of knowledge and it was a productive one. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and being with us today. Thank you very much, Ms. Devika Abe Surya, Chairperson of Women Engineers Forum, for, for proposing and coordinating this webinar. Also, I would express my sincere gratitude to respected members of advisory committee. We are blessed to have you, your presence here today in this online platform. You are, you are always helped and guided us in every activities of the Women Engineers Forum. Also, a big thank you to all the participants today for making this webinar a successful and interactive session. Without your effective participation, our effort would not be a successful one. Thank you very much. And I would like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to IESL and the technical staff of IESL. Mr. Chamila, the publicity manager, Mrs. Ramani, the assistant manager, for the continuous for the continuous support extended to make this event successful. At last, but not least, I want to thank members of the executive committee of Women Engineers Forum who really worked hard to make this event successful. Thank you. 
ladies and gentlemen, once again, we thank you for being with us this evening. It has been a great pleasure and nice time with you all. Have a great time. Thank you.